Um, everybody, uh, back to uh, Siegel Talks uh, here on uh, HowlRound uh, uh, TV, HowlRound.com. Uh, my name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of the Siegel Theater Center here in New York City at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the City University. And uh, as those who have followed um, our work, we bridge academia, professional theater, international American theater. And what we do is host talks. We bridge, we have conversations. It's a place to think and to hear, and also really, really to listen, not just from New York, the US, Europe, but from the entire world, the global world, and the Siegel Center has always had that at the center of its mission. Um, now in this time of Corona, where the reality truly is stranger than fiction, where we look for meaning and where we have to make meaning of this new world where everybody is in the same boat. We don't know what will happen. The future is uncertain. Um, we feel strongly, actually, as always, that we should also listen to artists, that we should hear their voices. Artists always have been on the side of uh, justice, on the side of social progress. And almost always, they were right early, early on. And their work detected things up front, uh, and, um, and so they are uh, significant in their contribution, not only what you see on stage and the aesthetic representation with bodies and symbols and signs that help us to understand our lives better, our families, our relationships, our states, our system, what's right and wrong, but um, uh, also um, the way they see the current situation often and is, is closer to what a concrete truth is and what reality is. The Siegel Center at the moment is the only institution in New York City, a uh, theater institution that does a daily new programming. We have every day a new talk that is about theater, as perhaps even in the US or in the Americas. Um, and those, these are new talks. And with us, we have two representatives uh, of uh, theater cultures that are thousands of years old. They are significant, they are vast. Uh, we do not know enough about it, but they have been to the Siegel Center. They have shared with us their great, great work uh, with us <clears throat> is Shahid Nadim from Pakistan. Shahid, welcome. He actually also just gave um, last year the address of the ITI World Theater Day. And um, we have with us um, the also great Abhishek Majumbar, um, the great, um, great uh, 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 theater director, writer, thinker from in India. So really um, welcome everybody uh, to be on board and just joined us is Anurupa Roy. Um, she is connecting uh, to our audio. She is a, a puppet player um, and one of the great uh, so visionaries uh, and socially engaged artists um, in India. And um, so she will uh, be with us um, in a second. So um, maybe uh, we start uh, off, uh, maybe Shahid, uh, where are you now? And um, tell us what time it is. Well, it's uh, Lahore, Pakistan, 9 p.m. And I am uh, sitting in my study. Um, I've just uh, uh, had my son uh, uh, married just uh, exactly a week ago in the times of Corona. So Incredible. we are in a defined celebratory mood in spite of all the <laughs> lockdown restrictions. How does the wedding of a son of a playwright in India uh, look like? Tell us a little bit and welcome Anarupa Roy. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome. Thank you. I spoke about you a bit earlier. But uh, Shahid, uh, so tell us, how, how does a wedding in Corona time look like in India? Well, it's, uh, I wish uh, I had, um, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll see if I can share some photographs. Um, it was a strange thing because um, the girl was from Islamabad, which is about 350 kilometers, in the capital. And uh, we were in Lahore. And tradition is, as uh, Abhishek and uh, Anupma would uh, know, that the boy's family go to the girl's family and then they have a lot of ceremonies and then uh, the girl come along with the boy to uh, the boy's place. Uh, so that was the plan. But in this case, um, I, uh, it, because of lockdown and Corona restriction, my age and some conditions, so I could not go to Islamabad it was not um, uh, advised. So uh, as a, a very unusual thing, the girl's family 
they agreed to come to Lahore, get a house and establish it as the bride's uh, house. And then we went to that house and we had a uh, um, simple nikah uh, ceremony, uh, the, the religious uh, ritual. And the most interesting thing, which is unprecedented, apart from uh, this uh, issue of girls, family coming to uh, boys city was that the, um, uh, the mullah or the religious uh, person who then uh, uh, arranges um, the, uh, the the wedding uh, ritual he um, was wearing a mask so normally no uh, religious person is supposed to be wearing a mask. I mean, they insist on women wearing a mask, but in this case, he was wearing a mask and then we had a simple ceremony and um, they still haven't come to uh, uh, my home because uh, we could not uh, finish the preparations which we had for their part of the house. And um, we um, uh, put them in a club um, where they spent um, a week and now tomorrow they'll be coming and we'll be receiving them and we'll have some floral decoration, but something very, very uh, small and um, muted, I would say. But still, mm -hmm. on, uh, on screen, on Facebook, it looks splendid. It looks great. It's a great time. So unusual things are happening. Uh, rules yeah. are being broken. Uh, thousands of years old, I think, in Egypt for the first time. Mosque up close for a thousand years. Um, right. So how is it in Pakistan? Can you go out? Uh, can you do theater? Are people rehearsing? Are there shows? Yeah, well, uh, people, um, uh, I mean, there is a lockdown for uh, about three weeks. It has been extended now for another uh, two weeks. And in certain parts of the country, it is strict. In other parts, it is relaxed. In one city, like my city, Lahore, I live in cantonment. There's very strict and um, it's real proper lockdown. But outside cantonment area for uh, other parts of the cities in some uh, inner part of the city, um, you hardly notice that there is a lockdown. So it all depends which government and uh, which uh, class or which part of the locality you come. What do you mean which class? Uh, which class? Yeah, people who can afford to be locked down. And there are people who have to go out and earn a living. So, uh, because uh, my, my I was preparing a part of my house for uh, my son's, uh, or uh, the couple's uh, uh, abode. Uh, and uh, because of lockdown, it was, uh, uh, I mean, the, the workers could not come and uh, the shops were not open, so it could not be finished. So every day, uh, a, a carpenter turns up, but he doesn't have uh, the wood. The electrician turns up, but he doesn't have the cables. So a lot of uh, this cat and mouse game is going on because uh, of the restriction. Sometimes mm. they let you in, but without your tools, sometimes they let the, the stuff in and uh, keep the uh, te technician away. So, um, bit, so it's uh, quite mixed to the whole thing. Quite big, chaotic, not clear guidelines. Uh, people are not fully listening. But what about theater people before we come off the, to India? But what about theater? Well, um, are they open? Are people rehearsing? Most part of the world, they don't. But how is it in Pakistan? You see, when uh, we, uh, we, have, mm. we run uh, acting classes and at the end of a three month acting class, there is a performance. So the last performance was scheduled on the 17th of March. And just uh, uh, like one day before lockdown was announced. And we had to immediately switch to uh, an online, first time live streaming uh, performance. So we still got together the actors and about uh, like, um, 10 actors and 10 uh, participants with the uh, social distance. And, uh, but it, we made it uh, like uh, public that we will be performing uh, online live stream. And uh, the first time we got 
great experience that while we were performing, there were people who were commenting and uh, they were joining in. And uh, so there were several thousand people uh, while uh, the live performance, which we do normally uh, in a hall, it maybe 400, 500 people. So uh, we did that, but it was still considered a risky thing. So, so actors after, were on stage, 10 actors and directors were all in yeah. the room performing it was with Mark, stage, without it was, an, it was an open open air place, like a lawn, house lawn. Mm -hmm. But we had lights and we didn't have a stage or uh, such, such uh, technical stuff. But still, it was uh, a performance. Uh, and uh, on camera, it looked like a fine Good. performance, while uh, uh, on the ground, it was still something very basic. So, yeah. uh, so after that, uh, we have been uh, interacting. We have been having meetings on Zoom or Skype. We have been uh, having classes like writing class immediately uh, switched over to online class. That was not a big problem. But the acting class students, they are finding it hard how to have uh, acting uh, sessions or uh, sure. and theaters, uh, theaters are closed. Do you have performances? Theaters are there? closed. Yeah, they are closed. Abhishek, how is the situation? First of all, what time is it where you are? Tell me your location and... Uh... Yeah, now it's about quarter to ten. I'm in Bangalore, in the south of India, uh, in my house. Uh, yeah. Uh, the situation is very, very similar, actually, to what Shahid Sahib is saying in Pakistan. Uh, I think there is, of course, there is a lockdown for a similar period of time, as he mentioned in Pakistan here as well. And uh, there is a large uh, crisis, at least around where I live, and I think in most cities, even in Delhi, where Rupa is, which is a food crisis, essentially. That most of my day now uh, goes in sort of working on that because there are a large number of people around us who are, uh, many of them workers who are from other parts of India who are here at the moment, you know, migrant uh, mm -hmm. workers who have been daily wage laborers and uh, for last several days, they simply haven't, haven't made any, made a living. So, uh, you know, like there are, there are cases where people had grapes on the day the lockdown was announced. And for three days, they didn't have food, but they ate grapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of those classic, you know, problems in economics one learns of when one is in university. I mean, you see it playing out right now. Um, so there is an imbalance in terms of what does the lockdown mean to uh, different uh, strata of society? Uh, what does one have in order to deal with a lockdown? Uh, the government has announced that essential services will be provided. But then, of course, what, is, what it generally means that for someone like me who lives in an apartment, the essential services do not include me having to go out and make a living every single day. So the essential services are things which come in. But the essential service provider is almost out of that the purview of what does the essential service provider uh, need as an essential service? I think that mm -hmm. that's completely uh, unclear and not catered to. So at the moment, a lot of my time is dedicated to that uh, with a whole group of volunteers here in Bangalore. Uh, so you cook food or you bring food to houses? Uh, we are trying to get more and more dry food like ration, rice, wheat, dal, that kind of thing. Um, because the government supplies have uh, simply not uh, been adequately arranged. People haven't received them. So uh, the attempt has been to do that. But because there has been a very, uh, the lockdown was announced in a matter of four hours. It was announced at eight in the evening to be started at 12 at night. The grains which were supposed to come in from other cities uh, did not come in. So for the first two weeks or so, there was a big dearth of uh, grains in general. So automatically, one had to serve cooked food because proportionately, you can at least serve a meal to more number of people if you're serving cooked food rather than if you're giving you know, five kilograms of rice. 
so it is moving now from cooked food to being able to provide uh, dry ration to people. Uh, really, that's that's the most important thing that is going on in our lives, uh, at least around me. Even theater practitioners in Bangalore, a lot of them are involved in this work at the moment. That is going on. Um, and other than that, my daughter is four and she's had a very long holiday. So the rest of the time, my wife and I are mostly with her and uh, trying to make sure that she's able to have, she's, she's able to deal with this as a summer holiday and not as a pandemic. You know? So mm. uh, these are the two kind of uh, extremes of my life at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. And uh, Anurupa, welcome and tell us a bit, where are you now and... Uh... How is that situation for you? As you're one of the great puppeteers of India, you're one of the innovators of the genre, perhaps even globally. Um, and so where are you now? I'm in New Delhi and uh, uh, it's about uh, 9.45 now. And mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, the situation is similar to what uh, Abhishek describes, except what happened in New Delhi is the day the lockdown was announced, um, I live on the arterial road of New Delhi. It's called the Ring Road. It, it pretty much circulates all of, uh, uh, la, you know, all of the major part of the city. So all the uh, daily wage earners, which is uh, essentially the service providers, this is carpenters, masons, plumbers, delivery boys, um, a lot of people who basically run the city, uh, literally fled the city because the key concerns were what will I eat tomorrow because if I'm dependent on a you know a weekly salary or money that comes in because I have a contractual project and um, it was also almost the uh, end of the month so there was a question of paying rents to their landlords um, so I woke up in the morning to see thousands of people just walk um, and it's it's really one of the one of the uh, 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 strangest things one sees because you you see it in in movies you see it in documentary films but it really doesn't strike you till you see this because it's people carrying children animals utensils literally finishing a life in New Delhi where they had probably lived for many years and. Um, leaving for their villages, very unsure of what the future held. And the first conversations I had with a lot of them was uh, how some of them had been walking from Rajasthan, for example. Now, any place in Rajasthan, Alwar to New Delhi is 800 kilometers, 1200 kilometers, and would be walking, would be walking to Bihar. So we are talking, uh, you know, all of uh, north, uh, from northwest to northeast India, which could be up to 12, between uh, 1,200 and 2,000 kilometers. And um, so the first thing, very much like Abhishek is saying, was firefighting for us. So um, I, I live in a little community uh, of apartments and we set up a kitchen and um, it was uh, immediately cooking and handing over these plates of food to people who were walking. Some would sit and eat, some would just take this packed lunch and keep walking because they didn't want to lose time. And very unfortunately, the day after, the borders were sealed and a lot of these people were um, uh, sent back. So then we were uh, we received a whole reverse population because they got stranded at a bus stop um, and 600,000 of us. Uh, yeah, six lakhs is uh, six lakhs or 600,000. Yeah. Mm. That's a huge number. So 600,000 people. people marched on feet, possibly if were ready to walk a thousand kilometers. 600,000 people. Yes, with women and children, pregnant women, people. I mean, it was really, it was really something. And there were people who were, who hadn't eaten in three days because they had left Rajasthan the day of the, the shutdown and they were walking, they were on, on their feet. Uh, lots of young children. So the first two days was literally feeding this moving population, uh, which stopped very soon because the minute the borders were shut, and I'm very close to um, uh, not one of the borders, but one of the key gates to the borders, and uh, this entire population turned back. And uh, what was very interesting is the way people uh, in New Delhi literally rose to the occasion and kitchens popped up everywhere. People were feeding uh, uh, uh 
people every day. And once this situation died down, one realized that now there are people in shelter homes with inadequate ration supplies. And the other thing that came to us was, so puppet theater in India is a pretty diverse and very marginalized community. So a lot of puppeteers are seasonal workers. A lot of them are traditional puppeteers. In fact, a mere handful of us uh, actually live in the cities and are what would be called uh, contemporary artists. Uh, a lot of them carry on generational work and they're puppeteers for many generations. And the ones who don't farm, ones who don't have this piece of land to farm on are often the ones who end up in an, a slum in urban India. So the first crisis call came from uh, an artist's colony in New Delhi. In fact, uh, a year ago, this colony was broken down and it has existed for 30 years. And they performed the marionettes of Rajasthan, which is a very traditional, um, very colorful form. Um, and it's a community which is puppeteers, singers, drummers, circus artists, uh, musicians, uh, street magicians. And the first distress call was that there were, uh, there are about 800 fam uh, 1,800 families and about 800 were short of food. So the next firefighting was getting enough food to this group of people. The first thing that happened was that a kitchen was set up. The kitchen led to this uh, stampede. So immediately it was, you know, who can we give dry rations to? Who can get food? The minute this was addressed, which took about two days to address, we started getting phone calls from Rajasthan saying Jaipur doesn't have any food, Udaipur doesn't have any food. So it just, the first two weeks was just getting food to artists, getting food to daily wage uh, workers. So, and now it's a little bit better. There are systems in place. So there are donors, there are kitchens, uh, there are dry ration units, and there are suppliers. So it's getting a little bit better. Incredible. So it was an artist colony of 800 families, you said? Just 1, artists. 1,800. 1,800 families of artists and yes. uh, 800 of them were not able yes. to yes. provide and they would starve if not. And so you did uh, God's work there that is uh, just existential. It's uh, I, just listening to you, I get the chills and um, I never heard of uh, such things in, in, in peacetime. And uh, to Abhishek and uh, Shahid, do, do you even think about theater or do you now think about theater in, in a real way or a different way? Well, um, we, um, um, I just got a, a question from Dr. Fawzi Abdul Khan if we have uh, tr uh, traditional puppet masters in Pakistan. So I was just uh, responding to her. So obviously, uh, we, we um, shared the tradition of. Um, the string puppets, uh, especially the Rajasthan uh, type of puppetry, but it's almost dead in Pakistan, unfortunately. Anyway, um, about, about your question of thinking of theater. Yes, um, in fact, uh, uh, in isolation, you uh, um, think of, uh, you have the time to ponder, to wonder, to, um, to think of, um, uh, what to do now, because theater, as I said earlier, theater um, means uh, interaction, physical interaction, live interaction. Uh, that is the thrill and that is the force of theater. And here we are um, asked to be isolated, uh, even at an individual level, leave alone uh, having a gathering or having a, some kind of uh, audience. So this is uh, a question which we have been thinking, as I said, uh, for the acting class, which was uh, basically improvisation and then working on a script and rehearsing and then performing. So uh, we are at a loss uh, because our main uh, strength uh, was uh, this interaction, uh, physical interaction, live interaction, either in training or in performance. So we have been wondering, uh, I mean, we were not very uh, keen on social media or on online uh, um, 
performance or online uh, uh, teaching. But now uh, we are thinking on those lines. And uh, uh, in our acting class, which we are uh, now, uh, we have had it for two weeks, two classes, um, we have been discussing uh, this, uh, how to um, capture or how to uh, really feel this experience of an invisible enemy and this fear of each other, stay away from each other. Each, other, each one is uh, the other person's uh, um, uh, enemy, so, so to speak. So this, um, so they are working on this, uh, uh, some so stories or some ideas about fear, dull, that how uh, fear uh, affects us, especially fear of the invisible, fear of the unknown. Uh, so we are at the, this stage just discussing uh, various uh, concepts or storyline. And then we are thinking of having some kind of uh, rehearsals and auditions on uh, uh, online, like uh, prepare your work, uh, your, not only monologues, but also prepare your uh, uh, dialogues or your piece and record it and put it um, uh, on Zoom or uh, Skype uh, class. And then uh, the other person also not only uh, rehearsing those lines, but also keeping the point of view or the positions. So how we can like, uh, I've seen some um, images of orchestra, uh, how different um, musicians are playing instruments and then they are able to uh, combined. So we are just wondering whether we can have a performance in which we can have on Zoom or Skype like seven or eight uh, performers in their own uh, isolated space and then interacting and performing, uh, uttering dialogue, singing songs, interacting with each other. This is uh, something uh, obviously not um, what we normally uh, accept as theater, but I think we have to have some open-minded, innovative uh, experiments. Thank you. Uh, Abhishek, is that at all on your mind? Uh, do you question your practice of theater? Will it change or is it too early to? Hmm. Uh, no, actually, in one sense, I'm not really able to think about theater very much at the moment in terms of performance. Uh, Having said that, I also think that, uh, you know, till about last week, I was trying very hard to work on the things that I had committed myself to work on. So I was trying to maintain that sort of, that number of hours I work within all of this. Till I realized by the end of, you know, last week, which was already about three weeks into the lockdown, that it's futile. I'm pretending to... Uh, I, I'm pretending that nothing is going on outside, uh, which is big enough in a way that I will con keep, you know, continue to do what I'm doing, uh, which is simply not true. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of also the sort of issue I find, you know, university students facing now that many university students I talk to right now are doing these Zoom classes and so on and so forth. Uh, but nothing in the curriculum is really provoking students to go out and uh, you know look out of their balconies and windows and see what's happening. How do you, how can we, in a way, continue to do what we are doing in terms of intellectual thinking or creative thinking when we are just not, not in what we term as a normal uh, period of time. So in one sense, I think I haven't been able to think of performance. But on the other hand, this week, early this week, I, I stopped doing that. I stopped telling myself that, okay, I have to finish this much writing and that much reading. And I spent, started spending much more time uh, thinking about and working on the field. Uh, and I, I think there is something, not about performance, but you know, just as, as somebody who makes work, um, deeply disturbing about our society, which, which is revealing itself every day very practically as one steps out and comes back. 
because at one level we are saying this is a time of isolation so anybody who's stepping out is potentially risking themselves and the society on the other hand if you don't step out there is a clear risk which is just present people people are going to starve before they die of a virus it it really is that simple uh, last evening i had a list of 1200 families around me in a 3 km radius who who would need food by tomorrow afternoon like we would have to make sure that they get it it's just it's really that simple um uh, and the other thing that brings up is uh, is that i think we do not have a government anymore you know we, we just we just have an administration um because a government in its like classical hobsonian idea is that you place your security in the hands of a government but many of the governments that have come into power right now in the world where we are seeing all these collapses they have not come to power because people have placed this security actually people have placed their supremacist ideas in the hands of these governments so all that these governments are doing is protecting a certain class of people i know places where one kind of person gets food and the other kind of person doesn't get food you know like in the same place there are five children who lick a packet of salt after they get it but five houses down the line they've sort of got food twice uh and this is at the lowest level this is how elections are won this is how uh this is how we have ended up framing our society uh i'm very worried about that i'm i'm very concerned it moves me immensely last night i mean this is a cliche but i just simply couldn't sleep for very long uh because the imagery of the streets of the mohalla of it just refuses to leave you because it's so stark it's no longer i don't even know how to represent it if i ever wanted to make something so i'm not even thinking about representation at the moment uh yeah yeah so you basically uh, how old is your daughter four she's four yeah. and a half so you put your life at risk in a way to go out help people you put your family in the possibility they will have no no father so and you're not even doing your job your job is to do theater to write direct um in such an existential uh, uh, situation and um so what what uh, do, do you think uh, it will have an impact on society on government will there be a change or people upset enough some people say well as long as it's not bad enough people will not go on the yeah. street about it do you think this is a turning point uh actually i i think unfortunately it isn't a turning point that's what that what is what worries me even more uh because what we are doing here right now the big crisis that everybody is in a lockdown kashmir has been in a lockdown for you know now several months i mean for 20 years actually but okay technically say 9 months or something and people have been fine with it it's all right it's all right that kashmir has been on a lockdown because it's always that you know we always have this explanation that somebody else deserves to be punished for our security this is the premise in which you know big countries like india america they seem to be working on this notion that we have to be defended at somebody's cost it's just that you know this virus it simply tells us that you're not special it is that simple this is nothing special about us uh so there was no turning point when this whole thing happened in in kashmir there was no turning point when this happened in northeast of the country there had been several protests over the last 3 or 4 months in the country which was to do with this new bill that the government came out with uh which was clearly a very anti muslim bill there were people sitting in processions overnight for months in one place there was a complete like there was no press uh, release from the government there was there was complete like this notion that somebody deserves to suffer for the well being of essentially the upper caste hindu and i think we see versions of this in england we see versions of this in america we, we have seen versions of this in different countries but this is a great leveler in that way uh, 
I don't think this is going to be a turning point for the simple reason that we are not able at the moment to come together ideologically on anything. And hence, even when I go to the smallest, the poorest place, I see the four Hindu houses and the two Muslim houses separately. When there is no reason for that to happen, there is, there is simply no, no case for it. Uh, but it's, that, it's gone that deep. If there is a turning point, I think it will be when we recognize that there are so many people trying to help people out, even people who are otherwise on completely opposite political opinions, political positions, working together to get food to somebody's house. If that solidarity can remain after this crisis, we have some chance, we have some hope of reviving anything. But otherwise, I think, uh, I don't, I think this is just the beginning. I think we'll see many more of these things uh, because in the grand scheme of things, there is nothing special about this virus as well. It, it simply is asymptomatic. That's the only major thing. It's not the most infectious thing that has ever happened on this planet. It is not the most lethal disease that has, that has affected this planet. It's just one of the many things. It's going to happen again. Chances are quite high. Uh, but we are not, uh, I don't think we are equipped for it because we, we simply do not have a government. We have an administration. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anurupa, when is the last time you had a puppet in your hand? Very, very recently. Uh, I'll just pick up from some of the things Abhishek was saying that um, I had my first moment of crisis during one of these uh, sessions of, of, you know, uh, of, of running a kitchen. And uh, the two things, the two things that I realized, which are very key, one is uh, what Abhishek just talked about, is uh, uh, you know in New Delhi this this whole protest over the the law, the very draconian law which was passed, which was clearly an uh, anti-minority, anti-Muslim law, saw a huge number of protests and sit-in protests, which were protests by women, and one of the things that the protests did is artists uh, and people from really all walks of life were just physically present. And what is really interesting is that it has set up these really dynamic networks of people. And when I look at the feeding groups, now um, I'm, I'm uh, on these WhatsApp feeding groups where someone says, hey, you know, East of Delhi needs uh, uh, 30 food packages, West of Delhi needs 168 food packages you see that this network is not new, it's not, not post uh, the lockdown. This network was made in December when this law came into being and the protests started. So what is really heartening for me is that A, we have a network, B, as an artist, um, I feel this is a very important moment to have that conversation with people who I, I had boycotted for a very long time. You know, with people with whom my opinion does not match and I feel they are uh, bigoted or they are, you know, it's like we have this deep chasm in our society. So you're always on, you know, on this side or that side. And uh, I did pick up a puppet. So day after the lockdown, um, I decided to do these uh, very, uh, something I've been meaning to do for a while, just talk of the theater for five minutes and talk about the different forms of puppet theater across the world and literally talk about stories and narratives and how stories and narratives are transform transformative through puppets because there's something about puppets and dead material which kind of takes judgment away. You trust a puppet, you don't, don't trust a human being. You're judging the human being for color of skin, for gender, but the puppet is just the puppet is just the puppet. And uh, it's incredible because it's the first time I realized, I think, I, like a lot of theater people, I've had enormous disdain for um, showing my work online. Uh, live performances ought to be live performances. But uh, suddenly it became very clear that there is a whole lot of people, especially in a crisis, who are seeking, a, seeking stories, who are seeking reassurance. And one of the things a parent told me, which was really interesting, a parent of a six-year-old girl said, there are no stories about uncertainties. All our fairy tales have happy endings. When are we going to tell our children that life is uncertain? And it's okay that life is uncertain. And it really struck a chord with me. So one of the things that um, 
I really am trying to do with puppets is uh, perform something and tell stories regularly to children and to young people to literally engage with this idea of it's an uncertain world, it's a difficult world. We are all really angry, frustrated, and all of that is happening. What are the stories we need to retell? Because for me, uh, draconian laws, uh, you know, uh, self-seeking governments, dictatorships are really about loud one person, two person vested interest narratives. So where is the other narrative? And I think the arts now really, we have to, we have to uh, seek this other narrative very deeply and wonderfully this internet space is a great equalizer. You know, you might find it very difficult to get to that uh, um, prestigious theater and rent it for a day to run a show for a thousand people, but online, every, everybody can watch whatever you're performing. So yes, I'm sort of in that space. And now we're running a festival, which is essentially a fundraiser to feed the, uh, the essential food services. So our shows are going to be aired online uh, completely for free, but people contribute then and this money goes to the, the, uh, the food uh, collections because the food collections need to run for a long time. We don't know how long this lockdown is going to be. It's not enough to collect for a week or two weeks or you know, a month. This is something long-term till everybody can come back to jobs. And we don't know if there'll be jobs. We don't know what situation the economy will be in. So, um, so I'm sort of in a space where I'm looking at, can the, la can the arts have a life online? Can it generate funds? Can this feed into all of the things we really need to raise money for right now, including artist pensions, uh, you know, um, those artists who can't afford to pay rent right now. So it's uh, all of these questions as well. Mm -hmm. oh, what a crazy world. Um, here's Shahid and his uh, son has to marry, can marry in the traditional way. And uh, you guys are looking out of the window, seeing 600,000 people. I never heard that story. I, I'm stunned to hear that, you know, marching with, on their feet with their children on their back without on a walk that could be a thousand kilometers long. It's biblical. And... Um, in its dimension. Um, <clears throat> Shahid, um, how is the situation in Pakistan? How, how are artists uh, supported now? Are they in danger? It seems less traumatic than in India. Yeah, well, uh, about this image of um, thousands and thousands of people walking for thousands of miles, I'm reminded of the images I've seen about the partition of India in 1947 when sort of hundreds of thousands of people with their families and with their cattle and with their belongings, they had to move from one place to the other, in some cases walking, in some cases being killed. So anyway, the, I, would, um, I would say that this is something which in our living memory, it is really a game changer or a, a turning point. Um, but as uh, theater people, we, we cannot abandon the, the space which we had developed uh, after a lot of struggle, especially in Pakistan, where theater was considered as something un-Islamic, something which was not part of Pakistan's uh, uh, the new uh, found um, uh, Islamic culture. So, uh, so we can't uh, surrender that space. We have challenged uh, in the times of military dictators or in the times of uh, this Islamic uh, militants. They try to snatch or uh, the space, occupy it or push us away. And now this strange enemy has uh, entered and we have to find ways how to combat it uh, along with helping people who are being uh, very... Uh, horribly um, affected by it, especially uh, people who are um, uh, in need of food or in need of uh, medical attention. But as theater artists, I think apart from uh, going out and reaching out to uh, people who need our help, we also have to, de to develop tools to comprehend and uh, represent um, this a strange experience in our living memory. So 
we have been discussing it among uh, theater artists, but at the moment people are confused and at a loss and afraid um, and um, wondering what is the way out because it seems that this um, um, uh, the turning point is actually uh, maybe um, uh, 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 it's going to be uh, there for many, many years. So it's not just six months, five months. So we'll have to learn to uh, sort of meet this challenge, uh, especially for theater artists, but other performing arts also, which require live interaction with our audience. And uh, although right now we don't have an answer but we in Pakistan, the theater community, we are determined to um, find a way uh, by which we can uh, still provide theater, a socially meaningful theater in whatever way, uh, either um, in, um, on the, in theater halls, if they are not available, like they were not available during the time of military dictators, then house lawns, we already um, had a performance. If that is not possible, then through Zoom or Skype or uh, Google or whatever. So um, I think uh, this is a challenge for creativity also, that although the new technology and new media is not uh, a replacement or an alternative for uh, um, our uh, centuries or um, uh, thousands of years of uh, theater heritage, but we should make use of that and develop uh, a form. Um, like when new challenges come, then new forms of um, uh, uh, art have to develop. So we hope uh, with, uh, with the learning from each other's experience, we can um, find uh, sort of way out how to bypass this uh, hurdle created by this invisible uh, enemy. Yeah, yeah, I still remember your play you did at the Seagull of the courtyard of the families living together already under such yeah. complicated uh, um, yeah, uh, conditions and one wonders, you know, what are they talking about now? We had um, black playwrights with us um, in New York and they said their families are preparing their wills. You know, they don't know if they're gonna survive, they don't have money. Yeah. They don't have health insurance, so many work in the service industry. It's a, a bleak time. It's a time where uh, we really have to question ourselves. Uh, the Taylor Mack, who is from, also from the queer community, said, you know, we protected ourselves from AIDS all these years, and now a handshake can kill us. You know, uh, what, does that, what does that mean? And uh, Abhishek, your work, and remember your work on climate change, we got, also got a comment online you know, from someone said who remembered your um, your work so well, John Schultz, um, and that's great of you to participate. You did the great work on Kashmir also, the James of Aida and others. Um, do you feel uh, 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 that theater has really changed something? Is there something that in uh, the bleak outlook you have on the government, is that, did theater even work as a tool of social change? Both of you and uh, uh, Anurupa, you know, also as well, has that? Has it been effective? We have the Trumps and the, your president in, in, in Pakistan in charge, you know, is that, has it really worked? Has it been, do it, does it have to be different? Did it fail? Yeah. I mean, I think, if I may speak, <clears throat> yeah. I think definitely, uh, I think theater has been extremely problematic for the governments, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Last year, I had this strange experience that one of my plays was stopped in India. Jinzo Birka was stopped in India. It was banned. For, banned, yeah. Big story. For, and three months later, the other play I did was banned in China, which was to do with Tibet. And uh, really, the only redeeming thing about this was whenever now some of my students talk to me about, you know, what is the theater good for? I keep saying, you know, ask the governments because they, they seem to know uh, what it is good for. Uh, they, they seem to be absolutely sure that they, it is something very, and you know, something very dangerous and something that needs to be stopped. Although many, you know, big movies, they, there is, they have such a bigger audience than anything that, that I make, you know, I mean, I, 
I mean, the, the play I did on Tibet was seen by 5,000 people. It's nothing, you know, compared to the sort of bad press that China gets the rest of the time. Or, you know, the play on Kashmir, maybe so far 20,000 people all over the world have seen it. It's nothing compared to, you know, everything that has been said. But there is something about the combination of having a person standing in front of people, being able to deliver a story, like you, you, you're compelled to empathize with that person, and calling out a contradiction in society, which governments, which governments find it very hard to digest when people start listening to other people calling out contradiction. And not simply saying that, uh, you know, this is great about all the alternative or this is great because that's how that's how electoral politics works. Right. I mean, right now we are in, a, in India, we're in a world where the only reason for this government to be there is people asking. So what other option do we have? And you go to the theater and you suddenly see, oh, my God, there is like 2000 years of alternatives in front of you from theater around the world, which is telling us that there are not just two ways of thinking, there are 200 million ways of thinking. And that is fundamentally a risk to, uh, you know, a Modi or a Trump or anybody like that and their, their parties. So I think theater has been extremely successful in doing these things. Um, and at the same time, we are aware that uh, there are these people who are in power in the world right now. What a time. What a time that there's Modi, Trump, Bolsonaro. This is this is like the the right wing, you know, uh, dream coming true in the world. And if anything, I think the fact that so many plays around the world, from Tehran to you know Turkey to India, I don't know, I, I suppose in Pakistan as well, that are getting stopped. It just shows us that the governments are absolutely certain about the power of our medium. I think even more than we are. Uh, yeah. It's a, that's a the great answer. Theater is a model for something, if interesting, it's theater always. It is a model for something. And if it's real on stage, it could be real in life. And I guess that is frightening. And yes, I mean, this is, a, this is true. It's a fact that even, you know, the Nazi censors, when they did the big exhibition of their degenerated art, they picked artists. They weren't even famous yet, you know, the Noldes and others. But they saw something in it that was subversive. And we said, we do not want others to see that. And um, so it has an effect. But uh, Anarupa, coming back to your um, uh, uh, um, thoughts at the uncertainty, of, uh, Meredith Monk, who was on the program, said, you know, don't be afraid of uncertainty, she, she uh, uh, told us, and uh, to be open. And um, what are you, what are the stories you're going to tell? The, I guess the ones you show now for the fundraisers are existing plays you are redoing. But what might be the stories you think about could be of, 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 of importance to, to the audience in India? So uh, one of the things that um, uh, I've been really excited about in the last uh, uh, decade and a half, I mean, a little bit longer, is how in India the epics are, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are an area where you have uh, this control over people's uh, thoughts, it's a, a big political uh, tool, and it's something that our mainstream media and uh, the powers that be are constantly using to play people. And uh, one of the things that, that excites me about the epics is um, they really don't belong to anyone, and they're not meant to give you answers. These are stories which have existed for years and years and years. And one of the things that we have been very consciously doing is uh, revisiting the epics to if not ask big political questions, is to embed some very deep doubts about what is being told to you. Uh, uh, because if you can doubt something which has been given to you as the gospel truth uh, by telling you another aspect of the story, then there's a chance that uh, we can make people question what is the reality that is being presented to you. So, so for, in India, one of the key um, tools for uh, the current government has been a very big, um, loud uh, 
uh, press, especially television press and or, or, or online uh, 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 presence, which is selling one kind of narrative. Very interestingly, the idioms, the stories in this are of the epic. Um, so one of the projects we worked on was the Mahabharata, and one of the reasons for doing the Mahabharata was uh, uh, this text lend it, lends itself to constantly plant very firmly in the minds of people, especially the people I feel one can't always access because you don't agree with them otherwise. You have completely different political views, is to somehow embed a seed of doubt about uh, what they have heard and what has been told to them. And that I find is a very exciting space. Um, and fortunately with puppets, uh, you get away with a lot of blasphemy because it's just a bit of foam or wood or styrofoam. It's not really a human being. And uh, so uh, it, often people will come and watch it and be offended, by the, but at the end of it, feel very stupid about being offended or uh, be have have seeds of doubt and then be like oh not really it couldn't have been that important so this is a space we are trying to stride very actively and uh, so the Mahabharata is one of the stories we are going to stream and one of the things that I've been doing is continuously having conversations with puppet masters who are eight or nine generations of storytellers because in India what uh, has a real hold over people's minds is uh, our television, televised versions of the epics, which were a major source of propaganda for a while. And interestingly, one of them is back on air uh, and it's very timely. And I, so one of the things we do is uh, we immediately after the shows have conversations with these uh, masters who are the carriers of oral narratives. And what they manage to do is uh, immediately say, yes, uh, this is the story, but this is also the story. This is the bad guy, but he is not really the bad guy. If you knew his backstory, he's not really the bad guy. So interestingly, because it comes from this really rich oral narrative uh, and, and heritage, it's able, to, it's able to, I think, have this bridge with people. So one of the examples is we performed in Kurukshetra, which is uh, uh, really uh, can be a big right-wing hub and in our audience were about 400 members of a very extreme right-wing group. And uh, we were performing this particular version of the Mahabharata and we were a little bit worried about what would happen at the end. And our car was stopped because we were leaving in a theater van and we were going away. And it was stopped by the students and we had this moment of, oops, uh, anything could happen now. But interestingly, there were 150 students and they stopped us to say, don't go anywhere. We want to spend some time listening to the stories no one has ever told us before. So we spent four hours narrating the stories that nobody ever tells you. <clears throat> the so it is, mm -hmm. yeah. So it is in a way uh, a return to the mythical stories who in a way yes. contain the truths, contain everything in it in just the way we look at it, you know, define and the them and we have the to take them back. The Quick point, uh, Frank. Yeah make a quick point about what Abhishek was saying that uh, certain movies are uh, getting uh, like hundreds and thousands of uh, viewership and our plays or uh, such uh, uh, products are um, uh, seen by only a few thousand people. I think still, uh, then he followed up with the, 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 the power of storytelling. If, if you are directly talking to your audience it's almost sometimes like a live like we are now interacting so sometimes you forget that you are not sitting in one room so i think theater uh, online um, if it is presented uh, in such a way that you can give the feel of uh, theaterness to your audience and convey your messages and give them this feeling that this is a live uh, interaction uh, with them then even if we have a few thousand uh, uh, viewership, still I think they will have a much lasting, much deep, deeper impact on them than yeah. uh, what we, uh, uh, the impact of these stupid movies, uh, yeah. which get a lot of- uh, I think uh, the last episode of a popular TV show in America, which was called Friends, 
was watched on the evening when it was screened by 23 million, most probably half a billion people in the world have seen it, but we forget, we don't, I don't remember, maybe yeah. I, I don't think I saw, but I wouldn't remember. I do remember what I saw in theater is something different, but yes, the numbers are, um, uh, are shocking. I remember the New York Philharmonic that we exist for a hundred years and we have reached a million people. And it's a big number. And then you think, what a small number, but what it means and what it creates is of significance. Um, Maybe we're coming to a close, you know, um, think, let us know what are you listening to, reading to? And if there's something you can say to fellow artists around the world, whether they are in South Africa, in Belgium, in uh, Chile or in Germany, what is something you would say from where you are right now in Pakistan or in India, what they should be doing? Or to our listeners, what do you feel is a good advice? What, to, what is demanded of at that time? So. Um, Maybe Anurupa, we start with you and then go back to the Shahid uh, at the end. Um, I think I think uh, what is happening, some some of this is going to be irreversible, and this is going to last a very long time. I think we uh, will probably need to think what is our relevance in the world today, and uh, if we can't perform for people live as much as as we could and in the format that we could then how and in what ways do we reach out to people is, is a key, key question. But I also think it's very exciting because I'm able to sit and talk to uh, Shahid Nadeemji in Pakistan and to you in America. And we wouldn't have done this if this hadn't happened. And in, on an everyday basis, I'm talking to artists across the world, artists across India. We just don't have the time to really sit and talk about our practices, why we do what we do, and uh, those conversations are as important as creating work. And I think that uh, is something I've begun to value very, very, very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Abhishek. Yeah. I think <clears throat> say uh, to other theater artists is, you know, is to, is to do what we do in theater all the time, which is that we deny death its moment. We, we create plays, we go to the theater to basically deny death. It's moment. We we extend it. We we do all kinds of things with things with death, and we are living in a time right now where everybody every day the newspaper, the magazine is talking about the internet is talking about how many people died in Italy, how many people died here, so on and so forth. And this is the time to be alive more than ever, because if a handshake can kill someone, uh, we also must remember that you know we have lost a lot of time looking at our gadgets and this and that when we were not alive when everything was sort of peaceful in one sense. Uh, but this is the time, again, as theater practitioners to absolutely deny death, to live completely as much as one can socially, politically, and uh, in all other spheres, whether that is on the internet or by meeting the person next door, I don't know. But uh, I suppose denying death would be yeah. the thing I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say defy death because uh, that's how um, theater is, that we, you defy the, whatever is the given, whatever is the status quo, or whatever is the challenge. And uh, in terms of the, the message or the challenge at this stage, I think this corona um, sort of factor is going to have a deep impact on our uh, relationship with each other. Our, uh, uh, I mean, this concept of staying away from each other, even from your loved ones. I haven't hugged my son or my daughter-in-law for, um, uh, uh, for for a long time. So, so this fear of each other, we have to defy that, and we have to re-establish contact. That contact is not just physical contact, or to cherish the the moments when we had that physical contact. So, I think for as theater people we can build ways by which we can break this uh, uh, fear or suspicion of each other or of the society we are living in and bring people together uh, through art and through stories and through uh, uh, future maybe, future uh, post-corona society. So uh, I would say that uh, we have to, um, we have to, um, uh, break this um, wall of fear and um, re-establish our humanity 
uh, through spiritual and cultural and uh, online methods. And uh, let's have such interactions, which we are uh, having today. Let's have more of them by more um, countries and more uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, make a chain of uh, these death defiers. Yeah, and I hope that also the, the system that obviously doesn't seem to be working, that it will be shaken, that the cage will be rattled. Um, it's shocking to hear uh, what you reported from India. I've never heard that anywhere. Um, that 600,000 people march on foot uh, out of cities, possibly a thousand kilometers away, who's carrying their children. That you say there are 1,200 people in your neighborhood, Abhishek or um, um, Anurupa, that you care for. Uh, it is incredible and existential. And a, a time where we live in truly is unprecedented. We have to also be reminded part of the human DNA, the RNA, is virus based. We carry viruses in a way we are come out of virus. But now this virus, which is invisible and small, attacks us. We have two or three trillion body cells, but they come, it invades us, it reproduces and kills us. And we. Hello. I think we lost Frank. Yeah. Frank, are you still there? Yeah. I, and can you hear me again? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Yeah, so I said, you know, this is this invisible virus access and it's a doministic struggle. We are back, but it also hopefully unite us and but we need uh, uh, better questions and we need real solutions, solutions that do work and artists, I think, are on the side of truth. So thank you all. And tomorrow we have a great theater from Poland. Uh, it's the TR um, Warsawa and Gregor Szerzyna will talk to us with his team. Poland also is experiencing a difficult time, political time, now also in lockdown. Great nation of theater, one of the great ones, a super powerful also a while after World War II and still again, uh, very much present and things are changing there too. Next year, uh, next week, we have uh, uh, Milo Rao, the great Milo Rao from Switzerland. Richard Schechner uh, will talk to us. Uh, Basil Jones uh, uh, from the great Handspring, South African company, uh, the puppet company also. And we have Arthur Nazuciel, Nazuciel from France and the great Guillermo Calderon from, um, from Chile will be um, with us who wrote a play when uh, Chekhov died, the revolution was outside on the street and nobody knew what would happen. And, uh, let's see what all these artists will have to say to us. So thank you all thank and you, see you tomorrow. And thanks to HowlRound for hosting us at Emerson College and uh, for Thea and Vijay and the Siegel team, Sanyang, May and Jackie. So thank you all and hopefully you tune in. Bye-bye.